Hello everyone, this is Dark Alpha 12 here to Graphics Studios and Arc Alpha 12 Plays. And today, we continue our adventures in Summer Rose Court. In the last episode, we end up encountering, uh, well, for, first and foremost, we were told exactly what we needed to do in order to open some portals. That's great and all. However, learning about the portals also meant we learned about the fact the portals could potentially kill people if we opened them, which made Ruby very hesitant to do so, even though they're like, okay, so these people might die. When do you want to do it? Um, Ruby was like, eh, maybe just a little bit longer. And she wanted to research a little bit more history with, uh, about her family and about her connection to what they're referring to as Crescent Rose and all these other things. And in doing so, she decided that she wanted to go to the library and look up some of the stuff that made the Rose lineage special. And uh, in doing so, she ran into a very interesting character. We were reunited with, uh, <laughs> uh, with one of her old teachers and tutors, Mr. Ublek. Doctor. And with Ublek's help, he is going to basically give us a bunch of documents that were are pertaining to our query. What, what we are, what makes the Rose lineage special, yada yada yada. However, uh, he ended up in being interrupted by some arguments with some of Torchwick's men uh, and a familiar cat faunus that happened to pop up in the, uh, the courtyard. Ruby managed to intercede and said that she's going to be sending an official declaration to meet with this individual, uh, I believe it was the following day. And uh, we learned that this individual's name is Blake Belladonna, as many Ruby fans would already know. And she doesn't quite trust us, but she is appreciative of our interference because it managed to make it so that that way she could deliver some of the stuff that she needed to to. Uh, to Ublek because they're working together to study some of the Grimm that are going on uh, that are roaming around in the forest outside the city. Blake ended up not being a member of the uh, menagerie that we saw earlier, but is actually a member of some faunus that live in the, uh, the the forest, like a tribe or whatnot. So she's kind of mistrustful of humans and considering what's going on in the menagerie, very rightfully so. But, uh, yeah, so that's basically what happened last time. So let's uh, kick this up and figure out what happens next. The next day, I pace in front of the throne, waiting for Blake to arrive. Once Ozpin and Glinda were made aware of the situation, they agreed to meet with the Faunus representatives. Even though Roman has given Blake a pass, it was his people who had kept her from seeing us. Rome has been interfering with Fauna's attempts to communicate with the court, but why would he do something like that? How deep is his hold on the city anyway? Uh, preferences... Let's turn you down a little bit. You seem a little loud. At least half the guards, and he's master of trade as well. Ospin interrupts my thoughts. Excited? Very! I tried looking up what I could, but there's very little information about the Faunus here. We had Faunus in the desert, but the Kata tribes weren't friendly to strangers. Considering what I've seen, that's starting to make more sense. The Faunus of this plane are split into three main groups. The City Faunus the Southern Forest Faunus, and the Kata Tribes to the West. The ones who requested an audience are the Forest Faunus. Oh, really? I thought Blake was going to bring a city Faunus. This group in particular lives right on the edge of Grim territory. Very far from us, I might add. They still have regular contact with the city Faunus. And they're citizens of the kingdom. We need to cooperate with them. Yang, who's taking a break from training with the regular castle guard, is with us as well. She reclines against the throne with her arms crossed, here in the official capacity as Queen's Guard. So, is it like a delegation, or a group, or...? Just two. They say they speak for all Free Faunus. 
I don't like the sound of that. It's not long before Blake and her associate arrive. I take my place on the throne, feeling the vines tremble under my hands. Hello, Blake. Your Majesty. She won't be skipping on my title in front of others, it seems. I brought a leader of the Sinny Faunus. Adam. Oh, no! What? <laughs> oh, I was not expecting that. Oof. Okay. I brought the leader of the city faunus, Adam Tauros. Though we currently reside in the southern forest, both of us were born here in Vale, and still consider ourselves citizens of the kingdom. We're happy to talk to the queen, at last. Despite their words, their discontent is clear. They do not appreciate how many barricades were put in their way before they could reach this moment. Blake and Adam start talking politics and establish laws. Their biggest priority is shutting down the menageries. We think the segregation in places has its root in positive intent. Keep the Faunus and the humans separate to ease tensions in the city. A place for Faunus to open their own businesses and build homes that cater to their specific needs. But it's become clear that the execution is flawed. The menageries lack access to the same benefits that a human neighborhood of similar wealth would. For example, when our water supply became contaminated, we were denied permission to share with our human neighbors while the problem was being fixed. And when we dug our own well in the meantime, it was completely without aid from the city engineers or tools. We had to fund it all on our own. As I recall, I'm going to put a, a, I'm going to use a sort of similar accent to what I did with Jack and JPDE and use a British tone for uh, Glinda from this point forward because I feel like it'll help distinguish her from other characters. As I recall, we did send some of the city engineers down to help you. As I understand, you turned them aside because they wouldn't cooperate with the community. All the plans they drafted up would have caused damage to the surrounding buildings people's homes and when we tried to communicate that or come up with a different solution they stormed out I sank lower into my seat all of this seems like way too much and it all took place while I was hiding in the desert life has always been difficult for Faunus in this city ever since the attack on the Rose Throne seven years ago it's deteriorated even further Humans have an unfair advantage. They're treating us worse than animals. We're trying to salvage this before it gets any worse. Uh, let's ask for their proposal. So it's clear that what we have right now doesn't work. Let's change it. And how do you propose we do that? Your Majesty. I don't know. That's why you're here. You're the ones who live in the menagerie, so you have first-hand knowledge of what's needed there. And you're the ones who tried to meet with us for so long. What solutions do you propose? Blake and Adam share a look. A moment of tension passes between them. Then, without another word, they carry on as if they had rehearsed this. Our first priority is the destruction of the walls. They were built to protect us, but it's clear they're now being used as a cage. We need every stone torn down. We're still rebuilding parts of the city after the attack of the Rose Thorn. We can't spare workers to go destroy it again. What the High Wizard means is, we'll need to schedule this carefully and find the resources to begin such a project. We have masons and laborers among the Faunus. Plenty of them have already promised their skills to the task. I just want to stress the importance of dismantling the menagerie walls more than anything else. That's a bold move. We'll need to proceed with caution. And wait for a proper time. We've waited long enough! Why are we moving by your time schedule when you aren't the ones directly affected? We don't need your help. We just need your permission. Or you'll slap us with destruction of public property. We might still. The court hasn't agreed to anything yet. 
then you haven't been listening to us. What could possibly be holding you back? This is such a waste of time. We can tear down the walls ourselves. You're the only thing standing in our way and we're losing patience. Is that a threat? That's so charming. Am I supposed to grovel after waiting three years for you to even listen to us? Yet now that you have your chance, you're about to waste your opportunity Her Majesty dying to give you. My, my companion is merely trying to... The physical barriers between human and the faunus are... Then tell him to mind himself while in the presence of the last rose heir. Glinda. He puts a hand on her shoulder, but she shakes him off. This is getting so ugly. This isn't a conversation, it's an argument. Ah! What do I do? I don't want them to fight. The vines around the throne, always moving onto the surface, start getting agitated along with me. I'm not sure how that happens, but they start to respond to my frustration. I should have expected no better from a band of silk wearing flat teeth. You don't care about anyone except yourselves. I clawed my way out of the Grim's Teeth mountain trails on my hands and knees. I was the only wizard to arrive in time to save this city seven years ago. Do not hurl such accusations at me. Don't rest on your laurels. You showed up once, then you abandoned us for seven years. At that last exchange, a stark pang of guilt stabs me. The steel vines burst out from their restrictions. The throne is no longer simple stone, but bristling and violent steel. Thorns brandished over every inch. I feel them prick just under my skin, easily sliding through the joints of my armor and the thin fabric of my clothes. The energy surges through me. Everyone, please! Enough! The wind of my semblance amplifies and grows. A gust of hot desert wind tears through the room and a sudden blast knocking everyone back a few steps. This is getting us nowhere! I didn't have this meeting so we could stand here insulting each other. As I calm down, so does the wind. They settle down, leaving rose petals scattered across the floor. We're here to find a better solution. Or at least the start of one. I still need your assistance with the coming grim threat. You need our help as well. We should be allies. The creatures of Grimm grow bolder by the day, even as we are distracted by matters here at home. So it won't matter who is Faunus and who is human. That is very easy for you to say. Regardless, we brought you here for more than just peace talks. The work you've been doing with Ublek has not escaped my notice. I'm very impressed by it. Had I known you were trying to contact us, I might have reached out to you sooner. The conversation winds down. After the tense moment we had just escaped, I find myself growing optimistic again. There's no reason we can't all work together. Perhaps we should take a break to allow time for everyone to have a more level head on their shoulders. I want to continue these talks to reach a more firm agreement. Would you like to return tomorrow? Of course. I'll bring the, upper, I'll bring the other representative as well. We'll take our leave, then. Wait a minute! Miss Belladonna, could you and I speak privately about something? Blake takes a deep breath, opening her mouth to respond. But before she can, Adam speaks for her. Of course she can. He reaches out and grabs her shoulder, squeezing with a white-knuckled grip. Yikes! Then he is escorted out. Hopping off the throne, I walk over to Blake. Would you like to take a walk around the castle? What? So we can talk. Oh, of course. Mindful of how I dragged her around last time, this time I gesture outside to let her lead. Yang makes as though she wants to follow us, but I give her my best scowly face. Alone, Yang. I'm just trying to be the queen's guard. But holler if you need me. <laughs> I'm sorry things got so heated in there. 
Me too. It's a delicate subject. Yeah, no kidding. But I hope that you and I continue being friends and helping each other. Of... Of course. I'll ask Master Ublek to help me compile the information into something easier to read. And then we can share with Lord Osborne and Lady Glinda. That sounds like a plan! Do you want to get started right away? Is that where we're headed? Because the library is that way. She points in the opposite direction. I'm taking the long way around so I can ask you something. Would you like to be a member of the Summer Rose Court? She stops in her tracks. Then she shakes her head, laughing under her breath. What? I'm serious! We have Yang to represent the western part of this plane and Glinda the north. Ospin's the east, and I'm here in the central part. Ideally, we're getting one or two people from each of the other planes. So, we also need someone here to speak for the Faunus in the south. What makes me your first choice? Hmm. I like you! Oh? You speak your mind! And Master Ublek likes you, too. And you're all, take charge, get stuff done. And you were trying to keep things cool in there. I don't know. I just have a really good feeling about you. I don't mind joining the court. But do you really have the authority to appoint me? Of course I do. I'm the queen. I think we both know better than that. What? I'd like to work together. But not if we aren't going to be honest about what's really going on here. My eyebrows furrow in confusion. I don't understand. It's all very convenient. The young and beautiful queen, noble and kind-hearted. Lost in the desert for years and years. Wait. Discovered in the middle of the darkest chapter of our history. Rushed back in utter secrecy. And now expected to lead her people to stability and peace? I know a story when I see one. It's... It's not a story. I am the queen. Blake rolls her eyes. You really don't believe me. You think Ospin made me up or something? Like a puppet? Frankly, yes. Why else would the queen be allowed around a dangerous faunus all alone. The gestures around us to the empty halls and my heartbeat starts to quicken. She does have a point. You're young, inexperienced, a perfect figurehead for Osborne and Goodwitch to pass whatever rules they like without taking the blame. I'm 17. That's an adult in the Jialong tribe, you know. Managing to stay alive past an arbitrary age doesn't make you an adult. It's what you've been through. You have no idea what I've been through! I know you want to help, but you need to wake up. Or someone like Ospin, or Adam, is going to eat you alive. Like this. Whoa! Hello there. That's, uh... <laughs> Oof. That escalated quickly. There's no other warning before I hear the rattle of chains. Blake moves impossibly fast, holding out her weapon and stretching it across my throat, shoving me against the wall. Show me your strength as queen. You can't, can you? She presses against me harder. You're completely defenseless. That's what they do to pawns, you know. They let them take the hits. Despite her words, her actions, I feel no anger from Blake, no hostility. She just looks sad. I blink up at her, my palms press against the cool stone. It feels like the arms of the throne, and I focus on that sensation. You'd better let go of me. Or what? I tense up, blasting out with my semblance. It hits Blake full force, knocking her backwards. The winds, ten times stronger than they had been in the desert, sent her tumbling head over heels down the hallway in a flurry of rose petals. Ah! 
As I walk over to her, I notice that she's lost the grip on her weapon. Bending down to pick it up, I give it an experimental twirl. A blade made of white bone connected with solid black chains. I approach her. She's sitting with her back to the wall, ears pressed flat against her skull. What was... How did... Reaching out with the chain scythe, I take the edge of the blade and hold it under her chin. I'm tougher than I look. She's quiet, eyes narrowed. Until I reverse my grip, holding the gr weapon so that she can grab it by the handle. After a moment, she does. She stands up and rubs her jaw, testing it by opening her mouth wide and wincing. So, that wasn't just a parlor trick back in the throne room. Nope! Black gold eyes, like freshly minted coins, stare at me with renewed intensity. How did you do that? It's my semblance, kind of. There's something in my blood, something that makes it very powerful. But that's proof I'm the queen. I'm connected to all sorts of things in this plane. I'll explain it more in detail later if you'd like. But in the meantime, is that made of Grimbone? Confused by my sudden shift in the topic, Blake stares at me for a moment before making the connection. Oh, you mean my chain scythe? She lifts up the weapon, displaying it to me. Yes! Does she have a name? No, not yet. But these do. Holding the nameless scythe in one hand, she reaches behind her back. And then she's a small straight sword, one I've never even noticed. This is Gamble, and Shroud is right next to him. They're all made of grim and bark from the ferris tree. But how? Grimbone is unbreakable without magic. And there's no fire hot enough to mold ferris bark. It's part of my research with Ubalek. Her eyes widen. Research that I've completely sabotaged by... Her ears droop down, hanging limply atop her skull. By... By attacking the Queen of Vale. Well, in your defense, you thought you were helping me. It was just... You were just... I really thought you were... An innocent little girl in over my head? She bites her lip to keep from incriminating herself further. You weren't gonna hurt me anyway. You're a good person. I can tell that sort of stuff. Lowering her head some, Blake keeps quiet. Queen's intuition? Exactly! Now come on! We have a lot to do if we're going to keep the kingdom safe. For everybody. I gesture to her to follow, and she does. Do you have a place to stay in the city? I do. Sometimes. Great! And reliable transportation to the castle if we need you? She pats her out her thigh as we walk. Do my legs count? Technically. But it might be easier if you just cut out some question. <laughs> but it might be easier if we just cut out that question of transportation altogether. Excuse you? We have a bunch of empty rooms that belong to the old court members. We could clear one out and bring your things in. If you wanted to stay here, that is. I... She swallows. Could I see the room of course let's go right now i love blake <laughs> i'm so glad i chose to go study with ublack and meet her i'm sure i would have met her eventually anyway but i am falling like head over heels for her in this game i i already have a massive crush on, uh, on blake in the canon ruby so this is just like making it so much worse uh, I still haven't decided what route I'm going to go down, but Blake is definitely high on that list. I know I've had a couple of people ask me to go down Penny's route, and I've been thinking about Renora, but I gotta say, Blake's tempting. Not gonna lie. A few days after I approved my first court member, I get a summon from Clinda, urging me to meet her in the throne room when I'm able. She's waiting for me when I arrive. Hello, Lady Goodwitch. How are things? 
only mildly chaotic, so a definite step up from earlier this week. Choosing a Faunus to be your first court member was... an inspired decision. I think it was the right one. What do you think? Other things have come to pass. Only time will tell if she'll be a valuable addition to our ranks. Valuable or not, I like her. Do you now? Um... I'll assume you have the kingdom's best interest at heart, then. <laughs> that look on her face. On both their faces. I love it. I... I think you might be confused. I think I catch a smile gracing her lips as I brush past her to sit on my throne. But when I turn, her face is neutral. Linda's teasing aside, I can't help but notice that the throne already feels more comfortable against my skin than it had been before. So, why'd you call me here? Just to gossip about my first court member? <laughs> no. Yeah, lessons continue tonight. We must begin learning how to wield the power of Crescent Rose. Cold shivers run down my spine, but I'm not in agreement. So, how do we start? Today, we're going to focus on your semblance. After attuning to the throne, its power has been doubled. As you so kindly demonstrated with the Faunus representatives. Um... <laughs> but how long can you maintain that power? I'm not sure. I've never tested that. Try now. No further instruction follows that, so I just do as she asked. I hold onto the armrest of the throne, concentrating hard. A gust of wind blows across the empty room, swirling rose petals swept to and fro by the force of it. Glinda stumbles, but doesn't lose her balance. Her cape flows like a flag in the wind. With no goal in mind, I just let the winds run rampant, coursing through the room. It's confined by the roof and the walls, but I have a feeling that if I put more energy in it, I could slam open the doors, crash through the windows, but... How are you feeling? Just shouting over the winds. A little drained. How long do I keep this up? As long as you can. As things turn out, we discover my limit is just a little over two minutes. By the end of it, I'm sweating through my clothes, and it's hard to breathe. Once I recover, we try again, this time standing up and far from the throne. This hardly counts as a field test, but at the very least, we now know you don't need to be in the chat itself to access its power. Now, how about maintaining control over it? How concentrated can the winds be? Are you training me or doing experiments on me? Both. I'm trying to discover the limitations of your power. So, we're messing around until we figure out what I can and can't do. Yes. Now, I want you to try lifting something. Briefly, I thought of Yang. She was more clever than me at about testing the rules. I'll bring her to the next lesson. But if she were here now, what would she ask me to do? An idea strikes me. I often use my winds as a boost to knock people aside or to propel me forward. But what about in other directions? Hey, Glinda, step back for a bit. I return to the throne and hop on the seat, which is the highest thing in the room. Holding onto the back of it for balance, I perch on the armrest. What are you going to do? Something stupid, probably. Jumping off the throne, I activate my semblance with as much force behind it as I can. The winds surge up, lifting me into the air. This time, the winds are so strong, Glinda is forced to her knees, instinctively covering her head with one arm as she glares up at me. Ruby. For a few glorious moments, I'm airborne, but I can't control the angle of the winds for too long, not with any kind of precision. They hit my legs, flipping me right side down. In my panic, I lose all control and go flying into... <laughs> In my panic, I lose all control and go flying off to the corner of the throne room, falling to the floor in a jumble of metal and leather. Ouch! Wrong outfit to try flying in. But I did fly for a few seconds. 
I know I did. Sitting up, I rub the back of my head as Glinda's heels click closer to me. She grabs my forearm, helping me to my feet. Strong enough to lift someone in full armor, then. She sighs. So, what now? Let's tone down the excitement for a moment. Force and power come easily to you. Now we'll test self-control. Pulling a gold coin out of her pocket, she places it on its edge so that it's standing like a little wheel. Move it as far as you can without lifting it off the floor or knocking it aside. What? That's stupid. I didn't ask for your opinion, Rose. I'm just going to knock it over. Try not to. For a moment, I wonder if she's messing with me, but Glinda doesn't break out into a smile or a laugh. I crouch down in front of the coin, pursing my lips. Um... Holding out a hand, I push forward with my semblance as delicately as I possibly can. The coin wobbles from the sudden breeze and rattles onto its side. See? Not satisfied, Glinda has me do the coin test at least a dozen more times before she lets me give up. What was the point of that anyway? What was the point of jumping off your throne like a lunatic? Why, well, here to see what you can do. Wielding Crescent Rose takes self-control. These tests are nothing more than using it to amplify your own power. The real test comes later. Tapping into the energies in the land of Crescent Rose itself. And then allowing it to use you. Disquieted, I sink lower down and sit on the floor, fiddling with the gold coin. Hmm. Sounds fun. Your parents did this before you. And my predecessor guided them as I guide you. It's what will keep us safe, Rose. Speaking of which, where is your glaive? I left Little Thorn in my room. Go fetch it. The very first thing Glinda does is enchant Little Thorn so it won't break against Grimhide. My grip tightens around the haft, watching her whisper words of protection and strength. I wish we had this seven years ago. We have been fighting back. Planning. Once the spells are done, she surprises me by moving her hands to cover mine. We won't make the same mistakes. I think I'm going to wind down now. I was expecting to have a little bit more co uh, conversations with Glinda, this was, which is the reason why that inflection ended in such a weird way. But I feel like this is continuing on with a different section, and I'm already about 40 minutes into this recording, so I'm going to cut it off here. So, uh, yeah, thank you for joining me. Uh, this is Dark Alpha 12, and I shall see you guys in the next video.